I studied science in university, and I wouldn't believe anything I couldn't prove. I had the view that religion was a con. I basically had been a Marxist. It was a way to manipulate and control people. And I despised all organized religion. I, any form that I ever saw or experienced, be it Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, I thought it was all a bill of goods that somebody sold you to control your mind, control your thinking. You needed something to deal with your fear of death. You needed something to deal with your lack of knowledge of the unknown and the hereafter so people would sell you a product. Come buy my product, be a Catholic, be a Protestant, be a Jew, be a Jehovah's Witness, be a Muslim, be a whatever. That was my view of religion. And quite frankly, it still is. <laughs> I was seeking God in a lot of crazy ways, and like a lot of people who are hippies, if you want to call them that, um, I basically had the idea, sort of, when I was a teenager, that, well, Jesus was God's teacher and God's prophet for his time and his culture, and Moses was the one for his time and his culture, and Buddha was the one for his time and his culture, and Mohammed was the one for his time and his culture, and that the Beatles and Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix were the ones for my time and my culture. That's what I, if I believed anything, it would have been something like that. And I uh, began trying to find the meaning of existence and truth in all kinds of ways. And like a lot of other people, I, I took LSD sacramentally as a way to become involved with the metaphysical world. And I used psychedelic drugs extensively. And I believed that the occult had to be scientifically investigated. So I used chemistry. <laughs> and I began experimenting with drugs, which soon graduated into an extensive research project. <laughs> but I wouldn't believe what I couldn't prove. Um, I studied science in university. And basically what happened was I was in Greenwich Village hustling drugs in New York and I was when I was in university. And I met people called Jesus freaks, hippies who'd gotten saved. And I walked up to this one guy with a cigarette, and I said, hey, man, you got a light. Well, he didn't have matches, but boy, did he have the light. And he began witnessing to me. Now, believe it or not, I got saved to this crazy group called the Children of God. And then I, I got involved with other crazy groups. And I was very unstable Christian in the first few years, in large part because of these unstable groups I was in, which virtually most of them became cults. Finally, when I became involved with Jews for Jesus, at a later point, I stabilized, but that's another story. How did I come to believe? I came to believe like this. I saw the youth culture of the 1960s disintegrating. Like New Zealand, America was in Vietnam, and uh, there was a protest movement, and we saw the corruption and hypocrisy of the government, and this kind of thing, and we were protesting the Vietnam War, and resisting it, and civil rights, and all this stuff. But I saw that the youth culture which set out to be an alternative to the establishment, be, was just as corrupt and hypocritical as the establishment, and in some ways even worse. Instead of finding love and peace, the only thing we ever found was venereal disease, people ripping each other off in drug deals, and the rest of it. That's what our youth culture came to. So I became very disillusioned with the hippie thing, and I thought there must be some way or some explanation for what's going on. Why is history a vicious circle? Why is there no way out of it? Why will everything naturally corrupt? You've got entropy in science and physics and chemistry and biology. Why do you have entropy in society and political movements? Why is this problem of entropy always around? It's the second law of thermodynamics. Well, anyway, no one ever witnessed to me per se, but I used to smoke marijuana and watch Billy Graham on television in America and curse at him because he played golf with Nixon. I hated this man's guts. Nonetheless, when I heard him speak, I would go to bed almost believing it. And I remember him talking about truth and how Jesus said, I am the truth, I am the truth. Jesus didn't say, I know what the truth is, or if you come with me, we'll find the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Now, somehow, what he was saying had an impact on me, but because he was part of the establishment, I could never accept it from somebody like him. I met these Jesus freaks, and they began showing me things in the Bible. And this brought me into a big problem. I could document with archaeology that the Old Testament, the Tanakh, was written hundreds of years before the New Testament. I could prove that. Go to the British Museum, they'll tell you that. There were dozens and dozens of prophecies about Jesus. 
all the other religions and, and, and what you guess today you'd call New Age philosophies that I had been interested in, be it the Tibetan Book of the Dead or Nostradamus or anything like this, or the Bhagavad Gita, their view of prophecy was always a matter of interpretation. How do you, how do you interpret it? But the Bible said direct things. Imagine me saying 600 years from now, 800 years from now, somebody would be born, wherever he would be born in Bethlehem, who his ancestors would be, that he would die by crucifixion 600 years before crucifixion existed in that area of the world, before it was invented, that uh, he would be betrayed by his friend, the price his friend would betray him for, that they would gamble for his clothes, that they'd give him vinegar to drink on the cross, that he would make the Gentile nations believe in the Jewish God. Dozens of things like that, written centuries before he was born, that I could intellectually prove were written before he was born. So what I began to do was take the laws of finite math that I learned in university and began applying them to biblical prophecy. And I found there was no margin of deviation. The same kinds of argumentation you'd use in putting together, uh, in testing a theory to, in order to formulate a postulate in science, the Bible would stand up to that kind of scrutiny. And this was not true of other religions. All other religions was basically blind faith. The Bible wasn't like that. The prophet Isaiah said, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. The sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God wanted to reason with man. And that was the first difference I discovered between the gospel and religion. All religion was based on blind faith. But the claims of Jesus and the claims of the gospel were rational. They were investigatable. And so I investigated. The two biggest enemies of the early church were the Roman government, and the Jewish religious establishment. That's a big question. If Jesus was the Messiah, why did his own people, by and large, not accept him? In fact, it's shocking to learn at a later point that extravagantly large numbers of Jews did accept him in the first and second century. Nonetheless, the Roman government, well, the Roman historians, if you read people like Tacitus and Suetonius that wrote about the early Christians, imagine me saying hundreds of Jews, hundreds, not all in the same place at the same time, but some in the Middle East, some in Turkey, some in Italy, some in Greece, some in North Africa, were willing to die the cruelest of deaths, even see their families murdered, testifying to their dying breath. They saw this man alive after he was dead. Now you can get some maniac in Texas or some guy in the jungle in Vienna to get a whole lot of people to die all at once in one place at one time, but to get hundreds of people in different places <laughs> That's unprecedented, saying we saw this man alive after he was dead. But the other opponents were the Jewish rabbis, and I looked at the earliest rabbinic literature, something called the Avodat Zerah, in, an, in a section of the Talmudic, actually it's pre-Talmudic literature, called the Gemorah, and I read it. And it was rabbis who were trying to convince Jews not to believe in Jesus because so many Jews were coming to believe in him. And I read this, and it said that Yeshu, it's an anachronism, a derogatory term for him, that he did miracles as no other rabbi, that he healed the sick, that he raised the dead, and that his disciples did these miracles in his name, and that after he was crucified, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. Now that was not written by Christians, that was written by unbelieving Jews. It was written by people who were trying to convince other people not to believe in him. When your followers say something about you, that's one thing. But when your opponents say it about you, <laughs> that's something else. It got to the point, I guess you'd call me an evidentialist, sort of like Josh McDowell type thinking. It got to the point where it took me more, just based on the objective evidence, it took me more faith not to believe it than it did to believe it. Just looking at the objective intellectual evidence for the claims of Jesus and the gospel and the Bible, it took me more faith not to believe it than it did to believe it. Similarly, when I looked at prophecy and the events that were happening in the world today in the Middle East and so on, just as the Bible predicted, it was incredibly accurate. More faith not to believe than it did to believe. I guess I believed up here before I believed here, but I couldn't have accepted it here if I wasn't first of all rationally convinced up here. That was just the way my head works. At least what was left of it after all the dope I took. Uh, I had many occult experiences, um, including uh, coming in contact with the demonic. 
also, I, I could meet somebody I never met and tell them uh, what zodiac they were, what sign they were. I went to a witch in the state. She used to read my tarot cards. And she saw in the tarot cards I was going to become a believer. And she began flipping out with the, her husband and myself. We did drug deals together. And she was flipping out. She was really practiced witchcraft. Not just tarot, but she was reading my tarot cards. And she began flipping out. Don't come back and burn me. Don't you come back and burn me when it happens. So, what are you talking about? Calm down. Will you roll the joint? What are you talking about? She saw that I was going to have this thing, you see. I had an out-of-body experience. And that's something I won't go into. It's not as dramatic as Ian McCormick's, but it's that kind of thing. A lot of things began happening like that. Anyway, finally, there came a point in New York where I said, Jesus, if you're real, if you're different than the plastic dude on the dashboard, that's the, the Catholics have that thing, and uh, if this book is true, then come inside of me and let me know it. That's all I said. Now, the Bible says God seeks the earth, seeking those who seek him. I grant you taking LSD is one Gehenna of a way to seek, but I was seeking. And that's all I said, but I meant it. And it was like getting hit over the head with a sledgehammer. I think, you know, you accept Jesus by faith, not by feelings. But I think in my case, I'd been so involved with the occult and psychedelic drugs that God said, this kid's so freaked out, I better give him a bolt of lightning, something like that. <laughs> and it was like that. And, and Jesus came into my life, and that, that was it. That's how I, I came to, to know Jesus. And I've always found that is the first difference between the gospel and other religions. The gospel is rational. The claims of Jesus are intellectually examinable. It's not a blind faith. All other religions are, even other religions that call themselves Christian. That's the first difference. The second difference between Christianity and religion is that all religions said man is basically good. We can build a brotherhood of man. Jesus said man is basically fallen. Therefore, build the kingdom of God. Don't try to build a brotherhood of man. It'll never work. That's why I knew that all these isms and systems would never work, you see. It explained everything. Man is basically fallen. And the third difference between the gospel and Jesus and, and religion is that every religion is man trying to reach God. With the Jews, it's the mitzvot. With uh, Muslims, it's the hajj. With Catholics, it's the sacraments or some other such thing. But the gospel is the opposite. The, uh, the gospel is God trying to reach man. Jesus doing something for us that we could never do for ourselves. Those were the three differences. The gospel is not a blind faith. Religion is. The gospel says man is not basically good. You'll never build a brotherhood of man. You either build the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. And the third difference is all religion was man trying to reach God, but the gospel is God trying to reach man in Jesus. Those are the three basic differences, and I've always stood on those three differences whenever I witness to somebody. That's basically how I got saved. I came to believe it here, or what was left of up here, before I believed it here. That's basically how I became a believer. That was the beginning. I threw my dope out the window. I lived across the street from the United Nations in New York. Later on, I, I was living in sin with a girl. I was told I either had to get married or get out, so I told her to get out. <laughs> it's been a long trek ever since. <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our minds, and above all our hearts to the glory and meaning of your word. Empower us, Lord God, to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. The Epistle of St. James, chapter 5. James, chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. 16 to 18. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain upon the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruits. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was a man who could make it rain. In other words, in pointing out that Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi, or Eliyahu HaTishbi, Elijah the Tishbite, 
and pointing out that he had a nature like ours, the Holy Spirit, through this text, is trying to tell us that if he can do it, we can do it. We can make it rain. But what does that mean? Elijah was a man who could make it rain. Remember I told you that different liquids typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects. Isaiah 24, the new wine is the Holy Spirit in worship. Shemin or oil is the Holy Spirit in anointing. But living water, Maim Hayim, is the Holy Spirit outpoured. That is, when it rains, it goes into the water table and forms living water. No rain, no grain. Let's look at John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The living water, what's poured out, is the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, the same idea. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Once again, it says God will pour out the water, that is, rain, onto the dry ground. And he says that this means he will pour out his spirit. Rain is a figure of the Holy Spirit being poured out. We see it in the New Testament. We see it here in the Tanakh in Isaiah chapter 44. Open with me, please, to Amos chapter 4, verse 7. And furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Pay attention. I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. Isaiah says that this rain is the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this rain is the Holy Spirit living water. It's what goes into the earth, into the wells. Amos says God would pour out the rain on one city, but on another city it would not rain. Why is it, for instance, that an evangelist like Reinhard Bunke, a powerful preacher, will go to Africa and thousands and thousands of people will be saved at one evangelistic meeting? Maybe sometimes tens of thousands will be saved on one crusade. But when he goes to his own country, Germany, or if he comes to a country like Britain or Australia or New Zealand, practically nothing happens in comparison. The same preacher, the same gifting, the same calling, the same anointing, the same everything, and in one place, everything happens, but in another place, nothing happens. The answer is in large part here in Amos chapter 4. God would send rain on one city, but on the city not send rain on, there'd be no harvest. If God doesn't send the rain, if he doesn't pour out his spirit, nothing is going to happen. It's a work of the sovereign grace of God and the outpouring of his spirit. All over the world, you see this. It is raining in Brazil. It is raining in Korea. It is raining in Indonesia. It's raining throughout Latin America, certainly. It's raining in the Philippines. It is raining throughout much of Africa. But in the Western countries, there is a drought. There is a drought in New Zealand. There is a drought in Australia. There is a drought in Canada. There is a drought in most of the United States. There is a drought in most of Western and Central Europe and Northern Europe. The whole world is like that. Trends in the world look just like this. God is turning his grace from the rich countries to the poor ones. White Protestant Christianity is in numerical, moral, theological, spiritual, 
decline, financial decline, all over the world. Where is the church growing? It's growing in the Roman Catholic countries. It's growing in the black countries, the olive-skinned countries, the yellow-skinned countries. That's the basic trend. The Church of England has declined immensely and is declining further, particularly in England. Yet in most of Africa, the Church of England is not declining. Almost every African Anglican is a Christian, almost everyone, Desmond Tutu being a notable exception, but all the rest of the Ang African bishops would be outspoken evangelicals. Africans being, African Anglicans being terribly persecuted by Muslims in Nigeria. The Bishop of Singapore, Bishop Tay, is an evangelical throughout Asia. Anglicans are by no means a dead church. They're a church that are very much alive. But in England, the Church of England is a dead church. Pentecostalism. The old-time Pentecostal fire that happened in the early days of Pentecostalism, like the Sunshine Revivals in Australia, and Azusa Street in California, and the Sunderland Revivals in England, and Smith Wigglesworth and all this, that's what's happening now in places like Ecuador. It's what's happening in Chile. It's what's happening in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's what's happening in Kenya. You look at a map of Europe, where is the gospel growing? They opened the brand new Assemblies of God Church in Milan, Italy several weeks ago. They were very disappointed because the day they opened it, it was far too small. The church had tripled since they drew up the first architect's drawing right under the Pope's nose in Holy Catholic Italy. You go, there's a thousand Assemblies of God churches alone in Italy and another thousand other Pentecostal churches. Most of them new, all of them growing, some of them quite big. Holy Catholic Ireland, more Roman Catholics being saved than Protestants. Spain, Portugal, evangelical churches are growing. Not only that, but in the Roman Catholic countries, when the people get saved, like once again, they come out of Rome. They say we've been saved out of this false religion. It's only in the countries where the gospel's declining where they're told to stay in. Eastern Europe, the Eastern Orthodox countries, tremendous growth. Russia, Romania, Albania, the Ukraine, the revivals among the gypsies are breathtaking. Unbelievable. The countries that did not have the Reformation. Where is the gospel declining? Where are the evangelical churches and denominations shrinking? Great Britain. England, Wales, Scotland, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, Scandinavia, the countries that have had access to the Bible for 500 years since the Reformation. In the United States, who's getting saved? Asians, Catholics, Hispanics, Jews, everybody but white Protestants. Your country, what's the same? When I speak at evangelistic meetings in the north of New Zealand, the north of the North Island, as I did with Barry Smith a few months ago. When we did evangelistic meetings, it didn't matter if I spoke or if Barry spoke, it didn't matter. Island people, Maori people, large numbers saved. The further south we went was only the Pakiyar, fewer and fewer saved. You go to Rotorua, a lot of Maoris, the churches are growing. I'll send rain on one city, but the city not rained on will dry up. People who are trying to bring a formula for church growth, saying if you get this program right, your church needs this program to grow, forget about it. It doesn't work. The best statistical studies that have come out of Fuller Seminary in America show that those homogeneous unit models in and of themselves don't work in terms of having an impact on sin. There's a missing ingredient, the sovereign grace of God, His Spirit being outpoured. Now, his word does not return void. Some people will be saved, one here and one there. But if you're talking about a massive harvest, no rain, no grain. But Elijah was a man who could make it rain. And he was a man like us. In other words, if he can do it, we can do it. I have no doubt in my mind that God wants to give the Protestant Western democracies one more chance to repent before Jesus comes. I have no doubt. 
But first of all, we have to get rid of our wrong ideas of revival. Revival is not a lot of people getting saved. That's the result of revival. Once again, you can't revive that which was never alive. Revival is the church repenting and returning to its first love. A lot of people getting saved is the result of revival. When God looks at the Western countries, he wants to give them one more chance, not for our sakes, but for his namesake. Not because we deserve it, we don't deserve it. Our churches are by and large backslidden. But for the sake of our fathers. It's sort of like what it says in Romans 11. God wants to give the Jews one more chance at the end of the world before Jesus comes. Why does he want to do that in Romans 11:25? It's because when God looks at Israel, God does not just see Israel's sin. He doesn't just see Israel's ongoing rejection of her Messiah. When God looks at Israel, he still sees Jeremiah in prison. He still sees Isaiah being sawn in half by King Manasseh. He still sees Zechariah being martyred in the temple. He still sees John the Baptist having his head chopped off. And he says, for the sake of their fathers, I want to give this nation one more chance. Great Britain is the same. When God looks at Great Britain, he doesn't just see Britain as it is today, a so-called Christian country where it says, Pater Noster Quius in Chalius, our Father who art in heaven on the outside of Parliament in Westminster in London, but in the inside you've got New Agers, Roman Catholics, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and God knows what else voting to appoint Anglican bishops. He doesn't just see Hindu gods being worshipped in Canterbury Cathedral and an evangelical archbishop who doesn't have the courage or integrity to stand up against it. He doesn't just see George Carey going on the radio denouncing Jewish evangelism and withdrawing his patronage from giving the gospel to Jews. He doesn't just see that. He doesn't just see bishops denying the resurrection and virgin birth and two-thirds of the other bishops defending him. When God looks at Britain today, he sees all of it. Past, present, and future are all the same to God. We have two words in Greek for time, chronos and kairos. But those are for us. God sees it all the same. When God looks at Great Britain today, he still sees John Bunyan chained to the wall of the Bedfordshire Gal for 14 years, writing the Pilgrim's Progress. When God looks at Britain today, he still sees John Wesley being stoned by mobs who were stirred up by the Church of England for preaching the gospel. When God looks at Britain, he still sees William Tyndale being burned alive at a stake by the Church of Rome so you and I could read this book. When God looks at England, he still sees Charles Spurgeon. He still sees Ridley and Latimer and Hooper and the ancient martyrs of England. And he says, I want to give this nation one more chance. Not because they deserve it. They don't deserve it not because of their sake, but for my name's sake. Not because of what they are, but because of what they were for the sake of their fathers. I want to give this nation one more chance. I'm convinced that's co-equally true about the United States. God still sees Jonathan Edwards and D.L. Moody and Harry Ironsides. He sees the faithful Christians. He doesn't just see what you have today with the prosperity preachers and the money hogs, and the heretics. And he says, I want to give this nation one more chance. And I believe this nation, New Zealand, is the same. God wants to give it one more chance. But for it to have one more chance, it has to rain. And right now, we have to face up to the fact that we're in a drought. And until this drought ends, all the programs in the world will never, never, never bring about a repentance in this nation and a revitalization of the church. It takes rain. If there's no rain, there's no grain. If there's no rain, there's drought. And if there's drought, there's no harvest. But once again, Elijah was a man like us who could make it rain. And once again, that same God, the God of Israel, is looking for people 
men like us, women like us, who can make it rain. Let's look at the life of Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu HaTishbi, Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, and see how God took a man like us and made him into somebody who could make it rain. Because the kinds of people that God is going to use to make it rain again in New Zealand and in Australia and in America and in Britain are going to be people just like Elijah. People with a nature like ours who God takes and turns into someone who can make it rain. Open, please, to 1 Kings chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook of Kirit, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and lived by the brook of Kerit, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in, in the dish and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first, and bring it out to me, and afterwards you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The dish of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the words of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. And the dish of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. And now a few verses from chapter 18. Now it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And then in verse 17, when he comes to Ahab, when, Ahab, when it came about, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? And then just concluding from verse 40, Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let them escape. So they seized them on Mount Carmel and brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his 
face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and he said, There is nothing. And he said, Go back seven times. And it came about at the seventh time that he said, Behold, the cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, so that the heavy shower does not stop you. So it came about in a little while that the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran. And of course, it rained, and it rained, and it rained. A bit of background. Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit. As it says in the story of Moses, when Jethro came to counsel him, God will take the spirit that's on you and put it on the others. The three and a half years that it doesn't rain on Elijah is a type of the three and a half years that you see in Daniel and Revelation, when the spirit's not being outpoured at the end of the world and so on. It's a type of what happens eschatologically when the spirit of Elijah comes back some way into operation as is predicted by the prophet Malachi. It's a symbol of what will happen at the end of the world. Similarly, the way that Elijah rescued the Gentile woman and her son teaches something about the way that God's going to use the spirit of Elijah somehow to take care of the Gentile church at the end of the world. It's a type. But again, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit. Midrashically, when you see events happening at the same geographical location in Scripture, it means that there's usually a theological connection between them. Elijah's ministry ends on the plain of Jericho, where Elisha's ministry begins when he gets his mantle, meaning his authority. And then where does John the Baptist's ministry take place? The same place, the plain of Jericho in the wilderness next to the Jordan. And what you had here was the wicked woman, Jezebel, who's a type of the woman Jezebel in Revelation, the spirit of false religion, turns the king, the political power, into a person she can somehow manipulate. And she covets the vineyard on behalf of Ahav, Naboth's vineyard. Now we're told that the vineyard in Isaiah and the gospel is, is Israel but it's also by extension or incorporation the church. And the wicked woman tries to get the vineyard for the king. This brings her into conflict with Elijah, and she persuades the king to try to destroy Elijah. This is exactly what you see in the story, again, of Herodias. The wicked woman turns the king against Elijah. It's a type. It follows the same pattern. Wicked women in the Bible all point in some way to the character of the wicked woman in Revelation. And the conflict with Elijah is replayed in the last days. Nonetheless, that's something I only mentioned in passing. It's semi-extraneous to our purposes this evening. Elijah was a man who could make it rain. The first thing we read about, how God takes a man like Elijah and turns him into someone who could make it rain, is what we read in chapter 17. Verse 1, why does the rain stop? Before we ask, what do we have to do to make it rain, we have to understand why the rain stopped. The rain stopped because of the sin of God's people. The reason the Holy Spirit is not being outpoured on the Western Protestant world is because of the sin of the Western Protestant world. And so much of the sin of the Western Protestant world is virtually identical to the sin of Israel. As you've heard me say in other tapes, abortion certainly replays the sacrifice of children to demons that we see in the sins of Israel and Judah in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And the worship of other gods. The priests of Baal were not foreigners, they were Jews. Today, it's the same. In your country, New Zealand, you're building your abattoirs, your freezing plants, facing Mecca to sell sheep to the Muslim world. And you export sheep for sacrificial purposes to, to, to Iran and these countries for Ramadan. The chapel, again, in 
Your university in Auckland is being used as a mosque with the blessings of your clergy. And more Muslims attend the mosque services in the chapel than Christians attend the chapel services. Britain is the same, only worse. America, the same. Australia, the same. The growth of New Age religions in the society, but also coming into the church, and even into the evangelical church. So much of the doctrine today that's permeating charismatic and Pentecostal churches are basically New Age doctrines being disguised as Christian. But when you look at them biblically, they have no basis. It's the sin of God's people that stops the rain. Once again, what's happening to our societies with the crime and the drugs and the homosexuality and the divorce, those things testify to the failure of the church. The first and foremost responsibility for the decline of Western civilization is not with secular society, it's with us. That's why the rain stops. A lukewarm materialistic church filled with crazy doctrines, the worship of mammon, which it disguises as Christian, with a version of faith that's not biblical. New Age religions, people trying to mix foreign religions with Christianity. That's what Roman Catholicism is. The compromise of God's people. And eventually, you have the priests of Baal. That's what happened in Elijah's day, and that's what's going on today. It's not raining in our countries because of the sin of God's people. But Elijah was a man who could make it rain. The first thing that God tells Elijah to do in verses 4 to 6 is go to the brook of Kirit, and there the ravens would feed him. You've got to understand what going to Kerit meant to him because it was on the other side of the Jordan. He had to leave his own land. He had to leave his own territory. Now to him, his land was part of his national identity, his cultural identity, and his religious identity. If you read it in the context of the Old Testament, when God told him to leave his land and go somewhere else, but then the ravens fed him. The ravens were not kosher. They were an unclean bird. God would provide for him in ways he never would have expected. The drought is so critical in the Western world that those who would make it rain will have to be people who are willing to go to Kirit. Sometimes it will mean churches having to leave traditional denominations that have compromised. Sometimes it will mean Christians having to leave churches that have compromised or that have gone into error and won't repent. And it will certainly mean trusting God to meet your needs in ways and in places we might not expect. Even things we consider to be almost unholy, like ravens. But it was the ravens who fed Elijah in a place he didn't expect, in a way he didn't expect. He had to be willing to put God first and his land second. And so often I find the problem where people are putting their land first, their culture, their identities, their denominations, and their loyalties to those things before obedience to the Word of God. But the people who will make it rain will be people who are not afraid to go to Kerit and trust God. But things get worse before they get better. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. It's darkest before the dawn. At the end of the tunnel comes more dark. Then comes the light. Things are going to get worse before they get better. That has to be accepted. The brook of Kerit will eventually dry up. What happens when the brook of Kerit dries up? Where does Elijah go next? In verse 9, he goes to a place called Tzerafat. Tzerafat comes from the Hebrew infinitive lisrof, to burn or to purify by fire. For God to take somebody with a nature like ours and turn them into somebody who can make it rain, 
they're going to be people that he's going to need to purify by fire. That's how he purifies us, by fire. There's going to be a very difficult period of not just trial and testing or even persecution or even drought, but all those things together and even to the point where the very people you tried to help will think you've betrayed them as it happened with the woman who Elijah came to. But look what happens. No matter how bad things get, no matter how dark it becomes, no matter how critical the drought, I can promise you two things. There will be flour in the dish and oil in the jar for those who are willing to be purified. Things are going to get bad. They're going to go from bad to worse and worse to worse still. That's the future of Western Christianity before the breakthrough comes. But no matter what happens, I tell you, there's going to be flour in the dish and oil in the jar. You'll have the Word of God and you'll have the anointing of the Spirit no matter what happens. You'll have your grain and your oil when the others die from famine. But then what happens? Her son dies. And he gets resurrected. The very people that you try to help will see the hardship and they'll blame you. But in God's economy, when things get so bad for so long, the things we love most have to die before they can be resurrected. So much of the church in the Western world will have to die before it can be resurrected. New wine can't go into old wineskins. That's the problem of the charismatic movement. They tried to put new wine in old wineskins. In order to renew a church, you have to renew the wineskins. The things that we've loved the most some of the things we've held on to the most and cherished the most, those things are going to die, but they'll be resurrected. And there's going to be flour in the dish and oil in the jar. God will purify those people who want to be purified. And after he purifies them, then things begin to change they really begin to change. Then comes the conflict in chapter 18. The conflict with Jezebel. The conflict with the spirit of false religion. The conflict with Roman Catholicism. The conflict with ecumenism. The conflict with Freemasonry. The conflict with Islam the conflict with homosexuality, the conflict with abortionists, the conflict with New Age. There's going to be a conflict. And those who will win that conflict are going to be the people who've been purified in Sarafat. So much of what we call charismatic worship today, I'm sorry to say, with the noise and the ranting and raving and the hype, it looks more like the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel than it does like Elijah. They don't know what real power is. So they turn to hype. That's what the priests of Baal did but notice the priests of Baal thought it would really work. They thought they could really get a response. The poor people today, our brethren who were caught up in restorationism, kingdom now theology, ecumenism, all of these unbiblical, false, and dangerous doctrines, all of it based, all of it is closely associated with hype, 
Just look at the conferences you're having. Prophets that predict things that don't happen. One fad after another laughing in the spirit. <laughs> they actually believe these things. But the conflict will come. Then the people will know who the true prophets are. And Jezebel won't like it. What's it say in verse 17? Is this you, you troubler of Israel? Is this you, you troubler of the church? Is this you, you troubler of the Baptist Union? Is this you, you troubler of the Assemblies of God? Is this you, you troubler of the Church of England? You who are standing up against ecumenism and against kingdom now and faith, prosperity, name it and claim it. You who are standing up against false miracles and bogus healings. You who are standing up against ministers making themselves rich by exploiting pensioners with lies. You troublers of Israel. That's what happened to Elijah because he was a man who could make it rain. And if you want to be somebody who's going to make it rain, that's what's going to happen to you. If you want to be somebody who makes it rain, that's exactly what they're going to say to you. But then what happens? They go to Carmel. I used to live on Mount Carmel. My children were born on Mount Carmel. Har Carmel. God's fruitful vineyard. It begins small. It doesn't seem like anything's going to happen at first. Where is it? Where is it? All the loud boasting and arrogance and cheering and hype of the priests of Baal. But God didn't work that way. It begins small, like a little hand coming out of the sea. I used to stand on Mount Carmel and look out at the sea when I lived in Haifa all the time. It always begins small, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, the whole sky is filled with rain clouds. The lightning strikes and God's spirit falls and it rains and it rains and it rains. There's no easy way out of this mess. There's no easy way to stop the decline of Christianity in the Western world that's gone too far for too long. We've been sold down the river by our own leaders. No easy way out of this mess. All the programs and hypes and gimmicks in the world will never, never, never bring a harvest of souls. That takes rain. The rain has stopped. Why has it stopped? Because of sin. Yes, because of the sin of society. But more than that, because of the sin of the church. And until there's a repentance in here, in here and in here, there's never going to be a repentance out there. Why has the rain stopped? Why is America declining? Why is Britain declining? Why is Australia and New Zealand, why are we declining morally and spiritually, even politically and economically? Why are we declining? It's not the primarily the fault of pornographers or pimps or drug dealers or homosexuals or abortionists. Not primarily their fault. Primarily, it's my fault because I have the gospel. It's my fault because I have the Holy Spirit. It's my fault because I know the truth and I have the message that can make the difference. It's our fault because the church in the West is Laodicea, because we're lukewarm Christians, because we're trusting in this life and this world more than we are in Jesus. That's why it's our fault. Look at our church today. One scandal after another, one minister after another caught in bed with somebody's wife, one minister after another caught swindling money. That's what the world sees. Hocus-pocus magicians that look more like magic shows and 
mass hypnosis. And like the real power of God's Spirit we see in the book of Acts or the Gospels. That's why we're in trouble. That's why there's no rain. And the first thing those who are going to make it rain have to realize is the reason it's not raining. It's not raining because of sin, because of my sin, and because of yours. Those who would make it rain will be the people not afraid to go to Kerit. They'll not be fenced in or bound by tradition or institutions. They won't be people who are going to try to put new wine in old wineskins. They know it won't work. They'll go where God tells them, do what God tells them, and trust God to provide for them in ways that might not be acceptable to them, but it will be the provision of God when it happens. They're going to be people who are not afraid to be purified. People who will go to Zarephath. People who are going to be willing to see the things that they've clung to and loved and cared about most dearly die. And the certain faith that those things will be resurrected in purity. It will be difficult. But no matter how difficult it gets, I promise you, there'll be oil in the jar and flour in the dish. And when the Lord giveth, he taketh away. But when he taketh away, he giveth back double and triple and tenfold. And then those people who are purified They'll go to Carmel. They'll stand in front of the woman Jezebel. They'll stand in front of false religion and New Age and Freemasonry and homosexuality and Roman Catholicism and Islam. And they'll stand in front of the priests of Baal, those who dare to call themselves ministers of the gospel who compromise with this stuff. There'll be a conflict. And those people are going to win. Those troublers of Israel are going to make it rain. And it's going to rain and rain and rain. Do you want it to rain again on the Western world? Do you want it to rain again in America? Do you want it to rain again in Britain, in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand, in South Africa? Well, if you want to reign again, God's looking for people just like you and just like Elijah. If you want it to reign, we have to go to Kerit. If you want it to reign, we have to go to Zarephath. If you want it to reign, we have to go to Carmel. Do you want to come with me?